West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com On Friday, when we last spoke to you and Richard, there were air sirens uh, going off. Uh, there was this sense that Russia was getting closer to Kiev. As Richard reports, it's, it's going to be, it, it is better fortified than perhaps anticipated, but that doesn't mean that Kiev will be spared from tragedy or from indiscriminate attacks on civilians. Tell me how you're doing today. I, well, we're doing fine. I mean, it's getting more difficult because the uh, sound of war is actually changing quite a lot. I mean, we used to have those missile strike once or twice a day. And, you know, it was loud. It was scary. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was like twice a day. And that's it. Now we can we have to live to this constant rumble of artillery up in the distance. And, you know, it does have an effect because, you know, those really like low bass notes, you know, you kind of you don't actually hear it. You just feel it, you know with your entire body and it keeps happening like nearly 24 7 so it's difficult plus i mean we're beginning to see indiscriminate strikes on kiev itself um but you know you know me i mean i i can't go without funny stories so one of the strikes actually hits uh a lingerie shop uh you know woman's undergarment shop uh in one of the malls in kiev and apparently it's the second time that particular brand of ukrainian you know w- woman's underwear was targeted by the Russians, so one bag, bag <laughs> begins to wonder what has Putin got against women's underwear. But yeah, it sounds you, like a you know, that's <laughs> that. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, it's get, it's getting more difficult. But look, there's a good way for you to know uh, whether Kiev's been surrounded or not. I mean, I'm not going to tell you where I am, but when you see a different background behind me, that means you know we left the house where we're at and moved somewhere else in Kiev. And that means, you know, the encirclement is complete. So we'll, we'll be the last ones to go geographically. Igor, you know, here it has been in some ways incomprehensible, certainly to me and I think to a lot of Americans that, you know, 16 days ago you were going about your life, your, your kids are going to school and now you are a country at war and policy decisions that the West makes hinge on whether or not they would put the world on a path to World War Three. Some of the ways that I think people have understood how brutal and how completely life changed in Ukraine are the images. And one of them was this woman who was carried out on a stretcher after Russians targeted a maternity and children's hospital, in Mariupol. And we learned over the weekend here from the Associated Press that she had died as had the child that she was pregnant with. I wonder if you can just speak to um, what, what you understand about the, the, the targeting and the, and the suffering and what women and children are going through. Well, look, the best way to describe it is that we actually have 
gray-haired 10-year-olds in in Ukraine now. And, you know, that just shouldn't happen in the 21st century. Um, but, you know, what's more important here, um, the Russian propaganda was pushing, you know, this completely ridiculous and horrific story that, you know, an attack on the uh, maternity ward in Mariupol was a Ukrainian fake. So that those were actresses playing their parts and, you know, everything was staged. And apparently there were like Nazis in that maternity ward. And, you know, we kind of, we, we know the truth now. And unfortunately, this woman and her unborn child have passed away. And, you know, if there's anything good to come out of a tragedy like that, I really hope it changes, you know, the narrative of certain media outlets in the West. I mean, Tucker still hasn't called and, you know, probably hasn't bought his plane tickets just yet. But, um, Look, another tragic story. First of all, I'd, I'd like to express my heartfelt condolences to the family of Brent Renoir, uh, you know, who sadly was killed by the Russian troops yesterday, an American correspondent. Mm -hmm. And today we've learned, like literally hours ago, that a Fox News correspondent is in, in the uh, intensive care unit in Kiev after being attacked by the Russian forces. So hope, hopefully, I mean, after this, we won't see any more Russian propaganda being pushed in the West. And, you know, I hope the narrative changes. And and I hope, you know, people realize that dignity is nonpartisan. Non and, you know, there are certain things more important in the world than money and, you know, political power. I mean, look, just, just the fact that you're aware of what Tucker is broadcasting is, is such an important reminder that the world is so small now because of the Internet, because of all of these bizarre um, associations. And the Kremlin has certainly associated itself very closely with Tucker Carlson's broadcast. I'm sure you've seen the news, if we've seen them, that his commentary airs in the loop on RT and, and on state media. I, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. I mean, the fact that one of their own journalists is right now in the intensive care unit at a hospital in Kiev, it's, it's your hope that they just stop with the lies and report the truth. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And look, I want to emphasize this point that, you know, uh, Russia, one of the things it uses really effectively against the world, especially against the free world, is information. Uh, you know, I've spent many years studying Russian disinformation and the theory of disinformation. I can tell you that, like, look, Nowadays, because of technology that we've kind of put out there, um, you know, information does have a physical, tangible effect on our lives. And, you know, I think sp spreading, you know, Russian propaganda and Russian disinformation in the free world is incredibly dangerous, especially given the fact that, you know, now we have reason to believe that, you know, unless Ukrainian army can actually push back on Russia and somehow settle this war within Ukraine's territory, uh, we're getting dangerously close to potential global conflict and you know it should be avoided at all costs i mean it's 2022 it's not 1941. i want to ask you about your president and his address to joint session of congress on thursday you um for his advisor what should he say what 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 do you need to hear him say to the united states congress well, I kind of I've already relayed one of the messages. I mean, it's oh, his prerogative to decide on what to say. Uh, but, you know, I think for the Western audience, for the members of Congress, for the American people to realize that, you know, this is the final battle between good and evil that determines the future, that determines how how we're going to live and what world we're going to live in. Uh, it's important to realize, it's important to realize there are things more important than partisan politics. There are things more important than fear and corporate greed. You know, you know I've, I've been trying to con con convince, for example, the Western business to leave Russia, at least temporarily. I mean, uh, uh, and look, God forbid it leads to World War Three. The do your companies really want to be the sponsors of that? And, you know, so I, I think like, look, I think the whole world needs to unite and solve this crisis. Because if you carefully study what's happening in Russia and what their propaganda is saying, Ukraine is just a temporary step towards, mm -hmm. you know, a major global conflict against the West. And you're the enemy. We're not the enemy to him. Putin doesn't mm -hmm. doesn't even recognize us as people, you know, we're, we're just something getting in the way. The real enemy here is NATO. The real enemy here is the United States. And, you know, it's better to help us now uh, that could avoid this conflict than to kind of to uh, be indecisive and then face the consequences that unfortunately will affect the lives of people not only in Ukraine, but globally. When you assess what Putin um, 
has at his disposal. Do you think that his military assets, his dumb bombs, his indiscriminate bombing of civilians, or his reliance on lies and propaganda to keep his power inside Russia, which do you think is more vital to him? Well, it's all about staying in power. I think, uh, look, it looks that Putin's lost complete touch in touch with reality. I mean, he's out of touch with it. And, you know, what's happening in Ukraine, I've been saying all along that, you know, this conflict, this war doesn't have any ideology behind it. It's basically, mm-hmm. um, you know, an armed robbery on steroids. It's genocide on steroids. So for Putin, war is a way of, you know, uniting the Russian people who've been zombified for 22 years by his propaganda to kind of to stay in power and to control absolutely every aspect of the Russian life. And by the way, having mentioned that, I want to give a shout out to a brave Russian woman called Marina Avsanikova, who crashed uh, the new primetime news on Russia's top TV channel today with an anti-war message. That's a sign, right? She held up a sign? Yeah, she she held up a sign. And, you know, we need those acts of bravery. We need for the Russian people to wake up and make themselves heard because, you know, they're going to be victims of this just like we are at the moment. And, you know, we need to stop it. Um, Another thing, uh, I I usually, look, I I have to give you something positive because, you know, today's (laughs) been a difficult day. Uh, We have this anecdote making rounds and, you know, I couldn't verify it, but there are pictures. So, I mean, you can look into it. Uh, One of the major like tragedies we're facing at the moment is to do with abandoned pets. So, you know, when people flee, they can't always take their dogs and their cats with them. So, you know, they let them out and, you know, they're starving to death and it's absolutely horrible. so this woman in the northern Ukraine, she actually she caught a husky. Uh, she saw a husky sad and slightly angry running in the fields. She kind of she chased it around. She caught it and she took it to the vet so the vet could treat it and then, you know, send, send the husky off to the shelter. Well, the husky turned out to be a wolf. So, you know, that, that is our Ukrainian women for you. Catching wolves in the fields with, with their bare hands. It is Tuesday, the 15th of March of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. A small scant dash. (laughs) Yes, a mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. It might even make a difference in uh, the Slavic areas of the world, too. You never know. That's why they call it hot smoked Hungarian paprika. Okay, I don't know what connection that has with anything, but we make the connections anyway. (laughs) That's the kind of world we live in. All right. Well, it looks like the disinformation campaign by Russia and our right wing, by the way, here in the United States, or should I say around the world, continues apace. And uh, uh, the uh, woman, the news editor on Channel One in Russia, who came onto the set during the primetime newscast, the number one, that's not only the name of the station number one but that particular newscast is the number one newscast in russia so i bet vlad was watching uh but yes the young news editor uh came on to the set with a sign saying no war stop the war you're being lied to etc of course her 15 seconds of fame didn't even get 15 minutes 15 seconds will uh garner her about 15 years of hard labor in a gulag. They call it prison, but it's a gulag. Come on. And apparently, uh, there have been so many arrests of protesters that it is straining the penal system in Russia. So I guess they're going to have to open up some more gulags to house all of these scuff laws. Yeah, they broke the law. Vlad said, if you say war... 15 years. I don't know how that accent came associated with Vlad, but it seems to work for me. And if you call any, if, if you just protest any kind of war, 
you can hold up a blank piece of paper and they're going to take you away for 15 years. A woman held up a sign that said, uh, well, first she uh, was approached by some documentarians, news people, I guess. I, I See, this is what I don't understand. They're showing these people getting arrested in Red Square. Well, what about the people filming them? <laughs> I don't get it. Anyway, uh, they showed a woman holding up a sign that said two words. That's what is in Russian. She wanted to express her two words, and so she held up a sign, two words. Well, that was too much for Vlad. Take her away. A woman held up a blank sign. Take her away. A woman came up and said, I feel content with what our military is doing in Ukraine. Take her away. If you agree or disagree, it doesn't matter. If you form an opinion, 15 years in a gulag for you. And our right wing just loves that. Oh, you mean that's what we can do too? Can we do that here? Jeez. Well, I do fear the terrible civil unrest that could occur if the breakdown of society falls along the lines as the right wing has been having a fever dream. Well, since the Civil War. I saw a little history of Jesse James and Frank James and their crew. And of course, we should remember uh, they were murderous Southerners. These weren't images of the West. This was the slave South. And in this little history, they talked about white men losing their rights. And that's why Jesse James had to act the way he did. He had to go against authority because white men lost their rights. What the hell? <laughs> what were those rights? To own another human being. Can you? <laughs> those are not rights. Oh my God, I don't care whether a contract was made. Mobsters make contracts all the time. They're not binding in court. I know. It was said in the Constitution, etc., etc., etc. Three-fifths of a human, etc., etc., etc. I don't care. White men losing their rights meant they could not subjugate a human being to being an animal of labor. They were such shitty businessmen, they had to enslave people to get the work done so that they could reap the profits. Hmm. Well, everybody else was able to figure it out without doing that. And yet we glorify a Jesse James. We glorify that supposed rugged individual who cannot live in a community because he's so rugged. He's so individual. We glorify that instead of glorifying the community member. I know that we do, but we, we have this myth of the rugged individual. And what is the rugged individual? Someone who is so antisocial, they cannot live in a community and, in fact, look upon it at, in disdain. And we're supposed to glorify that in a representative democracy. Mm. Yeah, I'm a little upset. Because I see what's happening in Ukraine, and we would have to fight off about half of our population to be able to fend off Vlad, because half of our population would be on his side, not knowing they're going to be lined up on the rock pile, too. I mean, hasn't anyone watched uh, Red Dawn? They keep invoking it. They keep talking about, oh, Patrick Swayze's going to be rolling in his grave. Patrick Swayze was rolling in his grave for dirty dancing. Jesus. I'd have him roll in his grave for Roadhouse. That's just me. Point Break was good. But, um, yeah. I mean, we used to make fun of Red Dawn because it was a jingoistic propaganda film. But it made a lot of sense now in retrospect, doesn't it? <laughs> you got the toady mayor toadying up to the Rus Ruskies. Not knowing he's going to be on the rock pile, too. All right. So 
let that be a lesson. And when it happens here, boy, there are going to be a lot of collaborators for Vlad. In fact, they're going to be protesting in truck convoys around D.C. Yeah, collaborators for Vlad. And then pounding on commuters' windows and making fun of their accents. Yeah, well, I'm going to make fun of their accents, Bubba. All right. Well, oh, what else is happening? (laughs) Oh, how about we get the electric car industry to bribe Joe Manchin more than the fossil fuel industry? Something has to happen here. Jeez. He's not going to vote for uh, Katanji Jackson. He's not going to let the, uh, you know, this this whole thing of. Of the electric cars, well, I can't, I can't let this uh, stimulus package go on because uh, too many people are into fossil fuels, or not enough people are into fossil fuels. Where am I? Oh, yeah, that's right. He won't uh, uh, let Raskin's nomination go through. That's what it is. Yeah, Jamie Raskin's wife nominated for the Fed, and Joe Manchin, a guy who's supposedly a Democrat. Well. He's got he's got the dark money guys on his side, and they don't seem to be very democratic. Anyway, uh, yeah, they're not gonna let G- Jamie Raskin's wife get through because Jamie Raskin was uh, a principal in the impeach one of the impeachment hearings against Trump. The guy's tr- set to destroy representative democracy, but I guess it's okay with the repugs. Well, it has to be. They're all dirty with dirty Russian money funneled through the NRA. I mean, (laughs) I just don't understand why that isn't trumpeted more. No pun intended. You got Butina, Red Sparrowing her way around all of the uh, principal organizers of the right wing. Infiltrates the NRA pumps the NRA with a bunch of money in which they doled out more money than ever before in the history of the NRA. And in fact, in some lobbying efforts, uh, more than any other lobbying efforts before. I remember people saying, wow, man, where'd they get all that money? We used to make jokes. It came from Vlad. And we were right. So here we have a guy rattling his nukes at us. We have active participants in this, which I would call them assets, and I'm looking at you, Tucker. And Fox News. It's Ruble Murdoch, not Rupert. It's Ruble Murdoch from now on, folks. And since uh, the Ruble is trading for a fraction of a penny, I think we could could call uh, Ruble Murdoch uh, penny-wise pound foolish. The, the They cannot hide behind the First Amendment when they are actively participating in the overthrow of our government while being uh, collaborators with a hostile foreign power who has threatened us with his nuclear weapons. People say, oh, well, you know, oh, Vlad, he won't uh, he won't use his nukes because, you know, he won't use it near his border. I don't think he cares. To be honest with you. Look what they did to Chernobyl. They were firing tank shells at the containment building at Chernobyl. Fortunately, it wasn't the the containment building. It was a uh, staging area right next to it, thankfully. (sighs) Like he cared. Did he care back in the day? I don't think so. All right. KGB. That's what it's going to be like. All right. Well. We got our Joe Manchins. We got our Ron Johnsons. We got uh, our Tulsi Gap. What what, what was her name again? Tulsi? We'll just call her Tulsi. I just don't get it. Jane Fonda is still pilloried for sitting on a Viet Cong tank. And then she apologized for it because she realized, oh my God, that's what that meant. And she's still pilloried over it. But a Bunch of GOPers can go party in Moscow on the 4th of July. They call themselves patriots. Patriot to who? All right. Rant is over. We do have a curated show for you today. Indeed, we do.
And uh, what shall we <laughs> what shall we attend to? Well, let's attend to it. At the top, the sound of war is changing in Kiev. We can only hope. On the rest of the menu, as we begin here on the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a new law that stops UC Berkeley from having to turn away thousands of students from its incoming freshman class. Yeah, one of these NIMBY neighborhood groups said, you're, 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 you're violating the uh, uh, environmental impact statement law because you're allowing kids to come into school. When, when, that has never been done before. Well, I got to tell you, there are some Republican types in Berkeley, just letting you know. Democrats on the House Oversight Committee want an investigation into ju- into DeJoy's U.S. Postal Service plan to replace its aging mail trucks with mostly gasoline-powered vehicles. And Trump has been accused of violating federal campaign laws by raising and spending that money for a presidential run without officially filing for his candidacy. He doesn't have to follow the rules. He's never been really held to account for any of it. Even the $20 million he had to pay for Trump University was a drop in the bucket of what he should have paid. After the break, <laughs> we move to the chef's table where a Tiananmen Square protester was killed in his New York law office. Immigration attorney, 66 years old. And Slovakia's foreign ministry expelled three Russian diplomats following information from the country's intelligence services on possible spying and bribery. Okay, let's do that here. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln thank you Kelly to the left of that chat room link across the page near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page and if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio and if you could afford to send us what you might spend on an espresso type coffee drink, and I guess that's going up now, but everything else is too. But when you can afford to do that, if you could send it our way, we are able to stretch those dollars beyond compare, pay our bills, fly under the radar, and continue this powerhouse of resistance against those dark forces arrayed against not only the United States of America, but representative democracy around the world. We uh, consider ourselves to be, uh, you know, we might be tiny, but we are a bulwark against that. And if we can get a few more bulwarks out there, we'll work in consort with each other and push back this right-wing fascist takeover of the world. We don't want it. But your generosity helps us do that, and we thank you for, for your generosity. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that, and we thank Tom for doing so. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that linked up on Twitter and other platforms. Sometimes I miss it, and you get it when I post for the podcast. So there was always that. And speaking of which, uh, you can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up those podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. And also the deep archive of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy and uh, the deep archive library of all the Netroots radio shows over these many, many years. Almost 11 
uh, can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Netroots Radio. All righty. This uh, first offering here is, oh, you know, I, I'm going to go ahead and mention this. I was thinking maybe I wouldn't, but I will. But uh, I got a notice from some former classmates about an assistant principal at the junior high in our old school district. I didn't attend that junior high, but my younger sister and brother did. Uh, the sister who's about a year younger than me and I uh, attended a different junior high and before we moved to the OC of you know Orange County, California. But anyway, um, an assistant principal at that old high, junior high uh, took his own life. He shot himself in a uh, teacher's lounge. They called it a staff, a private staff room, which is a nice way of calling it uh, the teacher's lounge. No one was present at the time. Uh, teachers of or staff had found him. I don't. They, they didn't specify if teacher or the janitor, but somebody found him in the in the teachers' lounge. And uh, so, people at the high school alumni page are pretty much up in arms, uh, like about how he could be so selfish. Doesn't matter if he's depressed. You know, he should have like killed himself at home and all this other stuff. And I got reprimanded for mentioning he brought a gun on campus. <laughs> Apparently that's okay to do. That's not part of the equation. But me bringing up the fact that the guy brought a gun on the campus with a bunch of little kids. I'm sad he killed himself, but he brought a gun on campus and no one's upset about that. Not one person. They're upset that he killed himself. In a selfish way, there were many, I have to admit, that were uh, acknowledging the deep depression that causes someone to do something so drastic and in a pretty drastic way. I mean, shooting yourself uh, at the school that you work at. So uh, no one knows why he committed suicide. He was well loved, well liked, well respected. So something was going on. I hate thinking about maybe there was a criminal investigation going on. But I'm going to hold that off because I have no evidence of it. But there's something going on. And uh, when you do a physical uh, exit like that, a visible exit like that, is uh, it, it, it's a message. But regardless, I was a bit upset that he brought a gun on campus in Everybody else on that old Orange County alumni page who happened to be a lot of maggots, by the way. I went over a few profiles, and boy, were they upset that black rap music was played at the halftime of the Super Bowl. They were going to go take a nap. That's not music. <laughs> I also got reprimanded because I reminded folks that, uh, you know, that's the same kind of BS people said about uh, rock and roll. No, rock and roll. Or, well, whatever. Anyway, um, I get reprimanded for bringing up the fact the guy brought a gun because, you know, guns are our God-given right. And how dare I question that? And I was thinking, you know, I suppose if we let these people get in power again, they're going to impose a 15-year prison sentence for being against guns. They saw how it worked in Moscow. They're going to do it here. All right. This first offering in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press by Janie Har and Adam Beam. California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a new law yesterday, Monday, that stops one of the nation's most prestigious universities from having to turn away thousands of students from its incoming freshman class. Now, I should mention that uh, the town of Berkeley does get fairly saturated. In fact, one of the most saturated urban areas uh, in the nation when classes are in session. And uh, But it does kind of crack me up that some NIMBY group filed a lawsuit that uh, the university didn't file an environmental impact statement for the incoming class this year. I mean, the school's only been in existence for, well, you know, since before the 1900s. But, hey, 
Just 11 days ago, the state Supreme Court ordered the University of California, Berkeley, to reduce its enrollment. The court sided with a neighborhood group that had sued the school, arguing university officials did not consider how adding more students would affect the environment, as a state law requires. So yesterday, Monday, the California legislator voted unanimously to change the law, sending a bill to Newsom, who quickly signed it. The new law gives schools more time to comply before a judge can order them to reduce enrollment. It's retroactive, meaning it reverses the prior court's ruling. I'm grateful to the legislature for moving so quickly on this critical issue. It sends a clear signal that California won't let lawsuits get in the way of education and the dreams of thousands of students, our future leaders and innovators, Newsom said. The law makes changes to the California Environmental Quality Act. Passed in 1970, the law requires state and local agencies to evaluate and disclose significant environmental, environmental impacts, or I'm sorry, environmental effects, of projects and to find ways to lessen those effects. But in the decades since its passage, critics say the law has often been used less to protect the environment and more to block unwanted development. In this case, the nonprofit group Save Berkeley's Neighborhoods, oh, I remember them, they're the number one NIMBY group in Berkeley had sued the university, arguing that adding more students would only worsen the housing shortage and increase rents for everyone in the San Francisco Bay Area city. Well, welcome to Berkeley! You see, Berkeley, like much of the rest of California, has an affordable housing problem resulting from decades of underbuilding. Now, I will say there's not very many infill opportunities in Berkeley. Just, just saying. And uh, let's see, on campus, housing at the school is limited and many students live off campus. Well, you know, they don't have to move very far to be off campus. Let's just be clear. Rents are expensive, especially for apartments closer to campus, while residents grumble over the added traffic noise and housing costs brought by an increased student body. The court agreed with the neighborhood group and ordered the university to stop construction of more housing and classroom space and to keep its enrollment at the same level as the 2021 school year. School officials said that meant they had to reject about 2,600 students for its upcoming class. And where would they go? The ruling stunned lawmakers, parents, and anxious applicants waiting to hear if they would be admitted this fall. University officials and students pleaded with state lawmakers for an emergency fix. Lawmakers responded with unusual speed. Well, of course, it is a Democratic-controlled legislature. If Republicans had any power, do you think this would be moving? I don't think so. Writing and passing the bill in just 11 days, most other bills take up to eight months before they become law. This would have shut the doors of college education for thousands of Californians, said Assemblyman Kevin McCarty, a Democrat from Sacramento. Our economy requires more college graduates. We know that college is the ticket to the, to the middle class. And that's why they want to get rid of it. When, when I say they, you know who I mean. Lawmakers hope the bill would end the controversy, but Phil Bacovi, president of say Berkeley's neighborhood, said this poorly drafted bill will result in more litigation. Oh, he's making a threat. You see, Berkeley does not have the capacity to handle more students. Of course, that's why they're building more housing. We don't want new students to have to live in their cars. No one has cars. I'm serious. There's nowhere to park. All right. Where are they going to park their car? You don't have a car in Berkeley. You have public transportation. UC Berkeley Chancellor Carol Christ said the school is committed to continuing our efforts to address a student housing crisis through new construction of below market housing. The law Newsom signed is narrowly tailored to fix the specific problem at UC Berkeley, but it does not include broader reforms called for by lawmakers from both parties. 
Scott Weiner, a Democrat from San Francisco, said the environmental protection law has been distorted by, beyond recognition to empower anyone with enough money to hire a lawyer or delay or block even the most environmental sustainable project, including blocking or delaying the construction of bike lanes, public transportation, and clean energy projects. Republicans agreed with Assemblyman Vince Fong, saying that frequently the reasons to stop the projects have nothing to do with the environment and everything to do with not in my backyard. In this reporter's opinion, of course. Assembly Speaker Anthony Rendon voted for the bill, but said he does not support creating more exemptions in the environmental law. We must act today in a cautious fashion to make sure the university can admit deserving applicants this year. Matthew Daly of the AP brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Democrats on the House Oversight Committee are seeking an investigation into a U.S. Postal Service plan to replace its aging mail trucks with mostly gasoline-powered vehicles. The plan largely ignores White House calls to replenish the mail service fleet with electric vehicles and has drawn sharp criticism from the Biden administration. Democratic lawmakers and environmentalists who say it falls far short of Joe Biden's goals to address climate change. In a letter yesterday, Monday, Democrats on the oversight panel asked the agency's inspector general to investigate whether the Postal Service complied with the National Environmental Policy Act and other laws when awarding a 10 year contract to Wisconsin based. Oshkosh defense to supply up to 165,000 new mail trucks. Only 10% of the initial order will be for EVs. The remaining 90% will use traditional gasoline powered uh, engines. The letter is signed by five Democratic lawmakers, including Representative Car Carolyn Maloney, the panel's chair, and Jerry Colony of Virginia, chairman of the Subcommittee on Government Operations. The lawmakers said they su strongly support purchase of electric vehicles for the Postal Service fleet, saying it would significantly cut emissions and position the Postal Service as an environmental leader in the U.S. A spokeswoman said the Inspector General's office received the letter and they were reviewing it. Meg Tenard of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. As former President Donald Trump continues to tease a future White House bid, a pro-democratic super PAC has accused him of violating federal campaign laws by raising and spending money for a run without officially filing his candidacy. In his complaint filed with the FEC, American Bridge accused Trump of, quote, 
illegally using his multi-candidate leadership pack to raise and spend funds in excess of commission limits for the purpose of advancing a 2024 presidential campaign, end quote. The super PAC says that includes payments for events at Trump properties, rallies featuring Mr. Trump, consulting payments to former Trump campaign staff, and digital advertising about Trump's events and his presumptive 2024 opponent. Well, let's get to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Chimpanzees can make tools, they display emotions, and they can outfox humans at certain memory games. But chimps also resemble us in another way. They use medicine. They're known to eat tough leaves and bitter plants to purge parasites from their guts. Now researchers have observed chimps applying a never-before-seen type of treatment. They snatch up flying insects and apply them to their wounds. You can see this happening in a video they filmed at Luongo National Park in Central Africa. Susie is sitting up, and then she's catching something from underneath a bush. She's putting it between her lips. She seems to press it, and then she's grabbing the foot of her son with a wound, and then she is applying the insect onto that wound. Simona Pica is a cognitive biologist at the University of Osnabrück in Germany, part of the team that studies these chimps. She says it's possible that insects have antibacterial or soothing qualities, but this could also be a cultural practice with no medical benefit at all. Maybe an individual just found out that it's intriguing, then I get a lot of intention, others come, maybe then I get some grooming. And so um, it just resulted into a social behavior. After all, Pika points out that humans perform plenty of rituals with no obvious function. Her team reported their findings in the journal Current Biology. And they write that this could be an example of what's called pro-social behavior. They help each other, and it's not just the mother helping her offspring, and it's not somebody helping somebody to increase their genetic benefits, but it's also individuals who are not related with each other. As for the insects, the team has not yet identified any remains. Because it's probably very, very tiny pieces, and we are primatologists, but now we talk to entomologists, and now we have an idea of how to find even smallest remains. And then there are also techniques to then identify the species. If they do, they'll be able to learn more about what function this practice might have, if any. And perhaps we humans will be able to learn some medicinal tricks from our primate cousins. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Colorectal cancer is the number two cancer killer of men and women in the United States, but it is preventable. Early on, colorectal cancer typically has no symptoms. It starts with a precancerous polyp or abnormal growth in the colon, which can be removed without surgery. Several tests are available to find these polyps, so they can be removed before they turn into cancer. Screening also finds colorectal cancer early when treatment works best. Recommended screening for adults at average risk begins at age 50 and continues until age 75. Learn about screening test options and find out which tests are covered by insurance. Talk to your health care provider about when you should be screened and discuss the best tests for you. For more information about colorectal cancer prevention, please visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? 
all we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. Our special guest this week is Mina Bose, the Peter S. Calico Chair in Presidential Studies and Executive Dean for Public Policy and Public Service Programs at Hofstra University. Professor Bose, tell us about the democratic norm of the rule of law. What makes a democracy function is the premise that no one is above the rule of law. That is, all people in the democratic, in the American Republic, citizens, voters, elected officials, are bound by certain rules and obligations. If those rules are violated, then the American political system has specific checks in place to restrict elected officials or even potentially remove them from office. Everyone in a democracy, in American democracy, is subject to the rule of law. Thank you, Dr. Mina Bose. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1887. This was the day the International Brotherhood of Painters and Decorators of America got their start, issuing their first charter. John Elliott led the founding meeting. Prior to moving to Maryland, Elliott had been involved in painters' unionizing efforts since the 1870s in New York. He was a strong advocate of the eight-hour workday. In Baltimore, he founded Painters Local Union No. 1. Elliott called the meeting to discuss forming a national painters trade union. Local Union No. 1 one, chartered 15 more locals from Pensacola, Florida to Peoria, Illinois. Painters in Toronto, Canada were also granted a charter, making the fledgling union a true international union. During the first year of operation, the union grew to represent 7,000 workers from 100 local unions. As membership continued to grow, so did the union's collective power. The Painters Union became known for their exceptional skill and quality craftsmanship. By 1918, the union had won the important victory of the eight-hour day and a five-day work week for its members. By the 1920s, the union had grown to represent more than 100,000 workers. The painters, like many other unions, saw hard time during the Great Depression. As construction projects dwindled, union membership fell by nearly half. During World War II, union membership surged again, reaching as many as 145,000 members. The union painters worked on many government projects as valued craftsmen for the war effort. Today, the union is known as the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, with a membership of 160,000 current workers and retirees. These men and women include painters, drywall finishers, wall coverers, glazers, glass workers, floor covering installers, sign makers, display workers, and convention and show decorators. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. Stick it 
Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 51 degrees Fahrenheit going to a high of about 60. We are uh, we have plenty of rain falling at the moment. And we had lots falling overnight. And I'm going to just tell you, we're going to abbreviate the local forecast and dive right into weather from around the world. And weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 60 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 52 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 63 and fair. Kiev is 50 degrees and partly cloudy. Kabul is 57 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 70 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 55 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 66 degrees with a heavy rain shower. San Francisco, California is 54 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is a balmy 52 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Anonymous staff at the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A dissident legal scholar who was jailed for two years in China after participating in the 1989 Tiananmen Square pro-democracy movement was killed yesterday Monday in his law firm's office in New York, where he had settled... After seeking asylum in the U.S., police said Li Jinjin, 66, was stabbed to death in the city where he had long worked as an immigration lawyer, even as he continued to advocate publicly for the many people jailed or killed by Chinese authorities during the nation's democracy movement. An arrest was made in his killing. Police uh, said Zhang Ning Zhang, age 25, was taken into custody and faces a murder charge. It was not immediately clear when she would be assigned or if she had retained an, uh, an attorney. Zhang Chen, the CEO of the China Democracy Party, said lawyer Wei Zhu, a friend of Li's, both uh, told the New York Daily News that the killing might have stemmed from Lee's refusal to take Zhang on as a client. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, reste toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne. Even more anonymous staff at the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Slovakia's foreign ministry said it has decided to expel three Russian diplomats following its assessment of information from the country's intelligence services on possible spying and bribery. The ministry said the decision was made on Monday yesterday, and the diplomats, based at Russian 
embassy in the capital of Bratislava had 72 hours to leave the country. It said their activities violated the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. The ministry said it has strongly urged the Russian embassy to make sure the activities of their diplomats were in line with the convention, which both countries are obliged to do. No deep Further details on the situation were immediately offered. The Slovak police and prosecutors announced there will be a news conference today to elaborate on the case of possible spying and bribery linked to the Russian Federation. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver